Good morning. So glad that you're here with us today. Welcome to Holly Springs. Um, if, if you are new here today, we're glad that you're here with us today. I got to meet a lot of new people as we were in the lobby waiting on uh, Taylor to finish with Sunday School. This next week, we actually go back to our original Sunday School, to our Sunday School classes. So if you're saying, hey, I came all summer, I listened to your pastor's talk, this next week, you actually get to hear our people come and they will break up into small groups. And, and that is where most of them who are so close to one another, that's where they get to love and just get to know one another is in small groups. So I, I, I challenge you, if you're not a part of a small group, because I know some of you, y'all come and you, uh, you, you love to come to worship, but you have never tried out a small group. I promise, try a Sunday school. Try a Sunday school on a, on a Sunday morning and you, I promise you, you'll enjoy it. You will love it. I know we have two new Sunday schools that are being uh, new this, this fall, that there's two new groups that are going to be joining, um, that are going to be coming to part of it. We're going to now have, I think, eight Sunday schools. We are just now starting a, a building project where we're going to add on storage buildings to that building, and we're destroying two classrooms here. So we're moving some of our Sunday schools around. So it's really an exciting time to be a part of a Sunday school and to be a part of, hey, I was a part of that Sunday school when they moved classrooms or, or when they were getting a new class. And it was really, it's really a neat time just for that scenario. Um, what we have today first is we have baby dedication. And we have two babies that we are going to dedicate. Now, the reason why I ask this, and then go ahead and come up, the reason why I say this is because people ask, hey, you have baby dedications three or four times every year. Why? Why do we have baby dedications? Now, this is important. Some of you come from churches that actually had infant baptism. And, I, and I, I probably baptized so many adults who actually were, who were baptized as they were young. Now, we do not believe that. We are Baptists. What we believe is, in believe, is believer's baptism. We believe in that, that once you make a profession of faith as, as a, an adult or even as a young child or like a, a youth age kid, that you then have the decision to make that I'm going to be a believer in Jesus, that they get dunked and they get as they're an adult, as they're older, when they are too young as a baby or maybe infant baptism, that is not their decision, that is their parents' decision. So what we do, instead of having infant baptism, what we do is we dedicate our babies that we would raise them up in the Lord. Now, there's two people who have, who have roles in a baby dedication. The first one is the parent, and the second is the church, that the parent would raise the kid in the in the way that God wants us to raise them. And Deuteronomy 6 says, it says that we, that we love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, and mind, but we also teach those ideas and principles to our children. And so that's the idea of what a baby dedication is all about. Also, as a church, we hold those parents responsible. And I know the parents that we have today, um, that they love the Lord, and they also love this church. And so I, I, I love to be able to, to do this, not just for anyone, but these two families are very, very special to us. And so let's uh, go ahead and start. Anna, tell us what you got. Um, am I on? Yes, thank you. Okay, so we are just so blessed here at Holly Springs to have so many young families, as Clint was saying about baby dedications. Um, and so we are going to start with the McCrady's. Um, they're going to come on up. This is Andy and Jennifer McCrady, along with two of the best big sisters in the world, Miss Joanna and Emma. And they are dedicating their baby boy, William Jackson McCready. Um, Jackson was born on August 12th, 2023. He weighed six pounds, 14 ounces. And the uh, name William is a family name on Andy's side. Um, and it's going on uh, six generations back to the first born male on that side. So no pressure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for them to have a boy. Um, anyway, and so the middle name Jackson comes from Andy's great-grandmother's maiden name. And so the Bible verse Andy and Jennifer have chosen for, for um, Jackson is Matthew 19, 14. It says, But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And so we are so excited. They are leaving with some fun devotionals and books for the girls and, and Jackson as they grow, and they'll get a faith box on their way out. And so... Um, our next family is um, the Bells, Mitch and Candace Bell. And they have a, an awesome big sister as well, Miss Anna Lee. And something special about today is today is actually Anna Lee's third birthday. So we can kind of celebrate her as well today. 
And so Mitch and Candace Bell are dedicating their eight-month-old baby girl. Her name is Adeline Marie Bell, and she was born on November 23rd, 2023, which was Thanksgiving Day, also really cool, um, and she weighed six pounds. And the name Adeline means noble, and Lynn and Marie are family names on both sides, and so that's how she got her sweet name. The Bible verse that Mitch and Candace have chosen for Adeline is uh, James 1, 17 and 18. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. It's funny, it's funny to see two, two girls, and then it's two girls, so if you got a, you got a shot, I mean, from our, our boy, we, I, I have three girls, so no matter, they say that, they say the chances get better. They don't get better. They don't. What if I had four girls? Can you imagine that? Um, but no, this is beautiful families. It's, I mean, when it comes down to both parents, I mean, I love that you're a part here of Holly Springs, and I pray that we would hold you just responsible, just that you're, you're going to raise the kids the way the Lord wants you to raise the kids. But also that, I mean, just that you guys are just loving to just, not just to our church, but you're loving to each other, and you're kind and sweet. And honestly, that's the, the best part about both of these families is that there's so much love that's in between every one of these. And so let's pray. We're going to pray over these kids, and we're going to pray just as a church that we would be responsible and to hold them accountable and to love on them all the way through. Because we know this as parents, it doesn't get easier. Sometimes it actually gets harder. So let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for how good you are. God, I pray, Lord, Lord, as we dedicate these kids back to you, that they are blessings, that we can be able to know that, God, that, 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 that kids are given to us so that we can be able to show them how to glorify you, how, how to love you. And God, I pray, Lord, that that's what we instill in our, in our families here. It's what we instill in these two families. And God, I thank you for the mom and the dad of these families. That God, that they are so meaningful and that you see them in their struggles and you see them in their successes. And God, I pray, Lord, that you take all the glory for them. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as, as we move forward as a church, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to stand up and be able to support them and help them in all different types of ways. And Lord, we pray that we just give you all the glory for all the things that you've blessed us with. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Pray for us. Let me pray for us before we start. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, and I thank you so much for all the people that are here. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be able to enter, in time, enter into a time of worship where we would be able to put our attention not on the things of this week, that we'd be able to put those things aside. And God, I pray, Lord, that we'd not be able to pay attention to crazy things in this world like the Olympics or whatever we think. But God, we do what we're supposed to do, where we give back glory to you, that we, that we praise your name, that we worship your name. And Lord, let that be our, 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 our sound today, that comes from our mouth, our lips, that it's not the songs that we sing, but it's who we're singing to that matters. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If you have a copy of scripture, I want to invite you to turn to it with me before we begin in worship to, ch to Psalm chapter 98. We want scripture to, to prompt us as we sing in worship and just want to lay the foundation this morning before we dive in of the reason why we sing. And the reason why we sing is because we have, as children of God, been redeemed into his family and into his kingdom. He has moved us from a place of darkness to a place of light. And that's incredible news for us as believers. And that's why we sing together. And Psalm chapter 98 describes this perfectly. It says, sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. The Lord has announced his victory and has revealed his righteousness to every nation. 
He has remembered his promise to love and be faithful to Israel. The ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Sing your praise to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn. Make a joyful symphony before the Lord, the King. Let the sea and everything in it about... In sh- and shout his praise. Let the earth and all living things join in. Let the rivers clap their hands in glee. Let the hills sing out their songs of joy before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with justice and all the nations with fairness. So we have a reason to sing. Amen. So we invite you to stand as we sing. I went down to the Crimson River Redeemed by the blood of the 
sing, He was. He was before there was light. Walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing. Behold Him. He who heard humanity's cry. Left a stone to wake as a child. He became like the least of us. Behold Him. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. Oh, be still and behold Him. This is who He came for. He who died with sinners and saints, healed the blind, the lost, and the lame. Even now he is in our midst. Behold him. He who chose the criminals in pain with blood to settle our dead. Bury he rose to life Behold Him Jesus Son of God Messiah The Lamb The Roaring Lion Oh Be still And behold Him Jesus Alpha that he is holy 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 is the lord god almighty worthy 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 to receive all praise holy Our 
sins they are many his mercy is more let's sing what love could remember this morning and we're going to continue through a time of prayer and we use this time as a church to be united in prayer and to pray over uh, these things that we that will be preached on uh, and Clint is going to continue this morning in our sermon series of Jesus's miracles post sermon on the mount and this morning we're going to look at this incredible encounter between Jesus and the man who wrote this book uh, named Matthew and inside of this encounter what happens is Jesus calls him to follow him, and it's significant because Matthew is probably at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to Jewish culture. I mean, this is not somebody that would typically be a student of a rabbi, let alone the savior of the world, and that's significant for you and I because we, 
uh, have mistakes, we have flaws in our lives, uh, we have things that uh, would put us in that category. Uh, and I love this last song uh, that we sang, uh, Behold Him, talking about He came for the lame and the blind and the lost. And those are, those are us. And so uh, we're going to pray through that idea this morning. And how this works is I'll give you a prompt. And if you will take that 30 seconds or so and pray either on your own individually or with your spouse or a friend or a stranger, um, whatever, however you would like to use this time. This time is open for you to use in whatever way fits you best um, spiritually. So uh, the first prompt that we're going to read through uh, and pray through is just simply thank God for rescuing you. Next, let's, let's pray and thank him for his sanctification in us, the fact that we're no longer who we were when he first saved us, but we have been uh, grown by the power of his spirit. Finally, let's pray for deepened humility within us that we would never forget where we came from and what the Lord has done in our lives. God, we thank you for saving us, Lord. Romans 5, 8 says that for a while we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us. And God, that's good news. God, we weren't looking to be saved, but God, you chose out of your mercy and your grace to adopt us into your kingdom. God, to give us a new identity, an eternal identity, which is a child of a son or a daughter of you. Now we get to be a kingdom citizens and we get to be light bearers here in this world. And I pray that this morning, God, as we dive into your word and as we look at how you called Matthew into a life of following you, God, would you help us to see how that would be us, God, how to follow you better? God, would you help us to see who you are, someone who calls the lost and the lame? God, would you, would you show us more of who you are this morning? We pray that, um, God, we would be taught by your spirit through your word. So would you give Clint the words to show us uh, what your scriptures say? and that they're true. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for this time, and we ask all of this in your mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Austin. If you have your Bibles, would you pop your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 9. Before we get there, though, I want to just talk with you. Um, I get asked a lot. They, they say, your introduction sometimes lasts longer than your whole sermon or your whole sermon is mostly just nothing but an introduction. It's true. It's not, it's not a lie. Um, today I want to introduce something even more. 
This week, I was asked, I, I, I got point blank asked, Clint, are you going to address, um, are you going to address the Olympics? Are you going to address how they portrayed a scene where they had transgendered people and different people who were dressed in different types of wardrobe playing out the scene of Jesus in the Last Supper? Now, I say this. Usually when it's political stuff, I say I stay in my, I stay in my lane. My lane is Jesus, God, the Lord. You know, it's, it's theo theology. They came into my lane. So it's not, it's not that I am picking to say, hey, I'm going to start talking about politics, but it's that when you come into my lane and you, now I can talk about this. So when you think about it, what would we say of how we would make this? Now, why I, why I would even bring this up is that Paul speaks to the Galatians a lot of the same ideas is that they start to bring in Jesus-like things, or they say, hey, this is a different gospel, let me explain this new gospel. And the whole book of Galatians is one of the first books that's ever written, one of the first letters that's ever written, and Paul really chews out the Galatians, saying, you foolish Galatians. And so he's not saying this in a kind words. And, and I think if, if Paul could write to us today, he would say almost the same thing. And, and, and if you have your Bible, you can turn to Galatians 6, because you're going to ask me, what was the scripture I read the first thing? And I had a friend that, who hit, sent me this, and he said, man, this is true more than any ever. And Galatians 6 says this, verse 6, we'll read all the way through that whole paragraph, all the way through 10. So 6, 6, verse 10 says, let the one who has taught the word share good things with the one who teaches. Verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. It's very important. For us to think that God does not see what we do here on earth is completely foolish. As we look and we shake our hands saying, God, I dare you to do something. And here's the thing, they might enrage you, but God knew it and he knows their hearts. I love, I love how Paul keeps writing, though. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, they will, he will also reap. Verse 8, for the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will be from the Spirit reap eternal life. That we see corruption all through the world, and we see that it is corruption all through the people. But for us, He's saying, stop, stop paying attention to that. Stop. And he says this, look, look what he says, verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good. Don't let it stop us. Don't let it be scary. Don't make it push you away. For in due season we will reap. And if we do not give, if we do not give up, and, and I love that, do not give up. He sometimes in other scriptures, he'll say, take heart, don't give up. Verse 10, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. That's who, we, that's who you're with today. I, I love that. God will not be mocked. He will not be, he will not be mocked, and especially when we look at the Olympics and how they portray Jesus and even the idea of what the Last Supper is. And at the Last Supper, what they did was they took the bread and they took the blood and symbolizing what Christ was really there to do. Today we're going to talk about what Christ came and what Christ came to do. So turn, make sure you have their, your book there at Matthew chapter 9. If you're new with us today, we've been walking through all of Matthew up from chapter 5 and we're going to go through all the way to chapter 10. And we've been talking about the miracles of Jesus. Last week we talked about how Jesus was there teaching in a house there in Capernaum, in this town. And there in Capernaum, he was there teaching in this town, and these friends, these friends brought this man to Jesus who was lame, who could not walk. And he was a paralytic, and they couldn't find room because it was so crowded, and Jesus was in a very crowded room, 
where there was nowhere else for anyone to stand or anywhere else, and they couldn't get the man inside. So what they did was they tore a hole in the roof, and they dropped him down. And you can imagine how big of a hole that would have been and how much mess it would have been everywhere. But they were so desperate to get people in, to get that man in front of Jesus. It's an amazing tribute if you really think about it, the idea that friends would do anything they could to get their, fr- to get their friend in front of God. Just to let you know, what have you done for your friends to get them in front of God? Maybe in front of the gospel, in front of what Jesus says. Have we invited them to church? Do we invite them anywhere? Or do we just kind of say, oh, those are my work friends, not really important, they're not going to be my church friends. And that's really, when you think about it, that's a, a wild world. But Jesus there, seeing the man, what he says to the man, he says something that, that he's never said before, but he says this, he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And he forgives the man's son. And, and, and his friends are probably puzzled. They're probably sitting there saying, we didn't bring him here for your sins to be forgiven. We brought him here so that you could make him walk. And so he knows that. The Pharisees who, who are there with him, the Pharisees and the scribes that are there with him, they actually start saying, what kind of man can be able to say your sins are forgiven? The only person who could ever say that is God himself. So who does this man think he is? And so if you think about it, what Jesus says is the most scandalous thing that he said in all of his ministry this far. That he's saying, your sons are forgiven. They had every right to take Jesus out and stone him to death right then and there. But Jesus turns to the Pharisees and says, what would be easier? For one to say, get up and walk, or for one to say, your sins are forgiven. And we we discussed that last week in detail of really which one would be easier. And it is easier for someone to be, to say, get up and walk. That that healing, which seems in miraculous and incredible, but, but not even the Old Testament prophets would even dare say, your sins are forgiven, because God himself is the only one who could ever do that. But then what he does is he says, my son, take up your bed and go home. He gets up and walks. If he doesn't perform this miracle, he has every, Jesus most likely could have died because he was blaspheming the Lord. Now, I say this because this is important. In all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I get, there's John, but John doesn't have this story. It's a different reason why. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that all of these stories, that the paralytic story is directly after the paralytic story is where we're going to be today. And we're going to be at the call of Matthew. And when I think of the call of Matthew, I, I still to this day, when I'm writing this sermon all week, I still get emotional. I, I don't think there's any story in all of the calling of his disciples that I, that I don't hear myself or hear my own conversion story in them. And, and maybe you do too. If there's anything that I would say the last seven or eight years since I've been with you, is that there's so many of you who walk to me and go, I know what your story's like, and I've lived what you've gone through. Not the same way, but I've lived, you're more like, you're like me. What, what it was, was I, I, I was a person who didn't grow up in church. I never really felt right in church. I never belonged in church. Um, we went to an Episcopal church um, that was an infant baptism church. But what we did is I got infant baptized. We showed up to church every Easter and every Christmas. And anytime my family felt guilty, I'm sure we showed up. But when it came down to it, we always thought, mm, church just wasn't important. We could do so much more on a Sunday morning than we could ever do if we went to church. I think the idea is the value of church, what we got out of church was we, we got it to check a card. Y'all remember, Bobby's explained multiple times that back in the day, even in Baptist churches, there used to be places, did I, did I read my Bible? Check. Did I, did I pray? Check. Did I go to church? Check. And all it is is the idea of checking boxes. And my mom and dad, that that's the kind of world that they lived in. But I've explained this, and I've uh, confessed this in front of all of you. I was a bad kid. I was not a good kid. Um, it's easy for some of y'all who know me well, they go, oh yeah, I can see it, totally. Um, and then some of y'all are going, oh no, he's, he, he would be, I'm telling you right now, I was a bad kid. I, I told you about my report card, I never had a problem with a grade pro- problem, I had a problem with the conduct. So in the, in the, back in the day, they used to have, um, I, I think they would never do this now, but now, back then, they would have an S for satisfactory, 
N would be means improvement, and U would be unsatisfactory, this kid is bad. I was the U kid, okay? I was a U. I always said something. If someone said something back, I said something. I was the one that could not sh shut their mouth. If, if an authority figure, like a principal, or even like a, a, a teacher was to say something to me, I would be the one that would have to say something back. And honestly, I, I, I can think back, and most of the shameful things that I did as a young person was what I said to adults, especially now being a dad or when I was a teacher. There were things that kids said to me when I was a teacher, because I was a teacher for 10 years. I was a chemistry, physics, and biology teacher for 10 years. And for those 10 years, there was things that kids said to me, and I kind of thought, yeah, I probably said worse than that. And I probably did worse than that. And this is not at like an older age. This is like grade school level. This is like fifth grade. This is like sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. I was a rough one. And I, and I just didn't care. I pushed the boundaries. I, was a, I had a mom and dad that really never said no. Um, my dad was a veterinarian. We had money. We, we were wealthy in the idea of like what we had. But we were so spiritually pure, poor, it was unbelievable. Now, for a lot of our time is that I knew where I was headed, and my family knew it too. My parents actually wanted it. They wanted me to head down the wrong road. They wanted to have the pasture parties at our house. They wanted us to be, be those people, and it was almost inevitable that we were. And then I just remember that I went to a retreat at our church. I was 15 years old, and I was sitting on the third row. And again, I didn't know church, especially a Baptist church. Episcopal churches, I don't know if you know this or not, but you like, they tell you when to stand up, they tell you when to sit down. They tell you when to stand up, you tell you when to sit down. So you know, you have this ritual. But I remember sitting on like the third row, and this man started preaching. Now, I was only there probably because of girls. Let's just be real. But I never expected to see and hear something that I needed to hear more than anything else. I remember a man getting on the stage, and I remember him talking about a house that all, everybody's house has one spot, maybe, maybe a junk drawer, or maybe a closet that's filled with all the stuff. If people come over to your house, you take all your stuff and throw it in that room or throw it in that closet so that it seems and appears that your house is in order and it looks good. Now, some of you in this room are like, I have that room and I have that closet, or maybe I have a lot of drawers. I've noticed even in my own life that Anna and I, I sit there and go, how many, drawer, how many junk drawers do we have? She's like, why would you ask that question? And I said, I was like, I didn't know I was going to offend you. She's like, well, it's just, I mean, it's very convicting. We have a lot of them. <laughs> we are homeschooled, so I think when you're homeschooled, you accumulate even more things than you ever thought. And all the homeschooled mamas are going, yes. But this man got on stage and said that what you do is you take all your junk and you put it in a, in a room to try to hide your sins. But imagine that Jesus was coming to your house. And imagine that every sin in your life was written on a sheet of paper and you had to file those and you had to stick them because if Jesus came to your house, you didn't want him to see all the sin in your life because if, you saw, if he saw the sin, then you would be condemned to hell. Now, that's not a scary thing. That's a real thing. That the sin in our life is the thing that keeps us from knowing Jesus, that keeps us from being able to know him in an intimate way. And the truth is, is that if you do not know Jesus and you have sin in your life, which all of us are sinners, all of us are broken, every one. No, not one of us is righteous. But those sins is what takes us to hell. It's not God. We send ourselves there. But I remember him explaining to me, or just sitting there and preaching and just saying, but what Jesus wants is for you to believe. He wants you to repent, turn from your wicked ways, which is what repenting is. Turn from your sin. Confess that he is Lord and believe. Now, some of us, all we know is we know how to believe, but we don't know how to confess and we don't know how to repent. And that's, that's an awful thing because that's what he calls us to do. But what he does 
is I remember this man, and I've told you all so many times on Wednesday nights, I didn't understand church. And he asked, he said, all right, I want to ask you to come forward if you want to believe. And I didn't understand church. I didn't understand the whole invitation thing. You know how we play the song and we ask people to come and walk the aisle? I just got up in the middle of the sermon, and I just came up, and he said, Sir, what do you need? Like, this is weird. What do you want? And, he, and I go, I want to believe. Because I knew how broken I was. I knew how messed up I was. I knew that I needed something. I needed something because everything that I was living my life for, I mean, I lived my life for baseball. I lived my life doing all the things that you're not supposed to do. I, I was one of those families that we were so busy being busy that what we did was we chased everything that was wrong. And I didn't want to be that. I knew my identity and I was ashamed of it because I knew where I was headed. I knew what I was supposed to be. And I thought, I don't want to be that. And this man's saying that this man will forgive me of all my sins. And what he said was, he said, what Jesus wants to do is he wants to come in to your life. He wants you for you to believe and repent. And he wants to, because think about it, how many sheets of paper of sin would actually be in your house if it really was? Your whole house would be filled with, with filing cabinet after filing cabinet after filing cabinet of every sin. And if I'm guilty of one, <clears throat> just one, then I deserve hell. And what Jesus wants to do is he wants to come in and with his blood, right, paid in full, paid in full. And so when I read this story about Matthew, and we ask this, here's what I want you to understand. He just gets up and goes. He just gets up and goes. doesn't ask questions, doesn't say, hey, let me prove apologetics to you. Let me prove uh, the existence of God. Explain, explain all of Genesis to me. Hey, I'll, I'll believe once I do this. And some of us in this room, that's who we are. We've always said, hey, I'll believe once I can understand this. Why? Who are you? You're not God. But I will say this. Ever since then, I've had so many times of struggle. But thank God he convicts my soul that I can confess, repent, and believe. So if you have your Bibles, look there at Matthew chapter 9. Look there at verse 9. Stand with me as we read God's Word. Verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining at the, with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for giving us this story of Matthew. God, we thank you so much for calling men to salvation. Just the idea of calling, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would have a calling on our life. That we are all called to follow you and you alone. Not the things of this world, not money, not, not our wives or lives or whatever, God, but we are here to follow you. And Lord, I thank you so much for seeing the broken and being the physician. God, we are all sick. And we all need you. In your name we pray. Amen. Again, that was some introduction. In this story, this is what I want you to make sure you understand. In this story, all three of these Gospels explain the story. Uh, Matthew explains it here in chapter 9. Luke explains it in chapter 5. And Mark explains it in chapter 2 of his Gospel. 
There's very little difference in the two. I will tell you every difference that there is, so don't worry about it. You don't have to go to those chapters. I'll tell you where they're different. But all three of the Gospels all start with a paralytic story, and then they have the Matthew story. So there must be a very good correlation in these two. So Because that, that's a very important thing, because if you think about it, we ask ourselves, so Matthew's just sitting in his tax booth, and Jesus just walks by, says, follow me, and he just gets up and follows him. Now, if you overlook the details and you overlook what's really going on and who a tax collector is, or even the idea of what Jewish people thought of a tax collector, uh, Austin explained a little bit of that just a while ago, but I want you to think about it. Who was Matthew? Now, in the book of Mark and in the book of Luke, he's not considered as Matthew. He is called Levi. He's, he's called Levi because that was his name before. And then what Jesus does is that when Jesus meets people and he, he gives them a, the old is gone, the old Levi is gone, and there's this new person that's come, and his name is Matthew. And there's so many of us that if, you, if I was to ask you, tell me about the old you, you would say, man, that was a different guy. Almost by a different name. I always make fun of Jerry Phillips in our church because I just enjoy it. But Jerry Phillips is our maintenance man, and I always sit, call him Larry when he's, when he's uh, acting ornery. When he's, when he's in a good mood, he's Jerry. Now, I love Jerry. Now, y'all start, can't do that. That's my job. I do that, okay? Um, but I, but I, I think about that all the time, is that Jesus changes his name from Levi. Think about it. He did that with Peter. Simon was his first name, and he changes it to Peter. He also uh, did that to, to Saul of Tarsus who we all know as Paul the Apostle. So he's always about changing who you really are. And, and I want you to think about it. If you know Jesus and he's called you to live for him, then you have an old self and a new self. Tell me about it. And, and there's nothing as a pastor that I'd love to more to sit down with you and talk about than talk about how your old self is gone and your new self is here. But why was Capernaum such a good place for a tax collector? It was a major road on the north of the Galilean Sea. Do we have the map? We do have the map. Um, if we look here, the north of the Galilean Sea was directly north would have been in Capernaum. You can see it, C-A-P-E-R, that right there, Capernaum at the very top. We could see that there was a major road that was right there. So as a tax collector, you love this road because this road was a place where you could be able to tax people who were traveling through town not just that, you also could be able to tax people who were in the sea. The people in the sea, that was a major harbor, was the northern harbor. So people who went fishing, let's say fishers like Peter, that he would go out and if he would fish, he would come back. However many fish he collected, well, then he would be able to tax them right then and there. So as a tax collector, Capernaum was an amazing place to be. And they could be able to do and get whatever they wanted. So a tax collector, why were they so hated? Tax, tax collectors were workers for the Roman Empire. Most of the people who were workers of the Roman Empire, you would think, well, they wouldn't sell out their own people. These were Jewish men that were working for the Roman occupiers of their land. That is, that is Israel. They consider that that's their land. That's what God has set apart for them. We read the entire first three, three books, five books of the Bible about how the Israelites fought for that land, how they went through just absolute hell to get to this land. And then the Romans come and they take it over. So when a tax collector then betrays his people, he's a Jewish tax collector, that then goes and works for the Roman Empire to collect taxes from the local people. Think about it. His job is to take taxes from his people. From his people. They were usually accompanied by Roman soldiers because they usually were, they were the brute help who would go and help them. So these people were considered awful people in their own culture, but these tax collectors, their job was to take taxes. What, what Rome would tell them was they would say, hey, you need to be collecting this amount, and anything you collect over this amount, you can keep. They can skim it off the top. The tax collectors were told that they needed to have a certain amount so that Rome would be happy and that the area would then be suffice of how much money it's bringing in. Anything over that, the tax collectors could keep for themselves. They would harass people on the spot, especially for those who were on the road or in the seaport. For there was no restrictions on the things that they could tax. 
or even the number of taxes. They could tax you coming and going. They could literally look at your cart. You might even say something wrong, like me, against authority, and I can guarantee you I would have been taxed. I probably still would. I still am, actually. Anyway, um, I'm not talking about taxes today. Um, but there, is, for the, there could be tax on any type of route. The fishing industry was incredibly highly taxed because it was profitable, especially at that time. Tax collectors controlled the entire regions. Think about this. They controlled everything about money, loans, the rates of the loans, and the debts. They always kept the debts. They would do anything. If you, if you came and you got crossed with a tax collector, he could actually tax you just because you said something the wrong way. Most tax collectors were hired men on their behalf so that they would collect. So anytime a tax collector who was a Jewish person, they could actually hire like big rough men. Like I would hire Taylor to go collect money. I wouldn't go and do it. I would just tell Taylor to. He's giant. He can go do that, right? If you don't want to, if you don't want to give money to Taylor, then you're not going to definitely not going to give money to me. But you would send people like Taylor to go and find and collect stuff. Tax collectors live luxurious lives because they, they skimmed off the top. They had stuff. They had property. They had land. They had houses. They had, they had materials. They had great clothes. They had everything they could ever want. They were friends with the Roman guard. And they also were friends with only the certain wicked people in the region. If they had friends, their friends were prostitutes. If they had friends, their friends were murderers and robbers and thieves. They're friends with the broken people. None of us good church people would hang out with those people. And sometimes I always ask myself, who do we attract? The good church people? Or do we attract the people who are the robbers, the murderers, the people who are the worst? Why did the Jewish people treat tax collectors so badly? They considered them as murderers and robbers and thieves. They were considered in a lower class. They were considered the worst of the worst, that no one could be lower than a tax collector. For these people, not just steal, but they rob in the plain daylight from their own people. That they are the worst of the worst. They are traitors among the own Jewish people. They are not allowed to testify in a court. They weren't allowed to go into the synagogues to be able to pray. They weren't allowed to go anywhere where Jewish people were at. That they would be spit on by their own people that their parents would disown them and they would be considered as gone. And they would not even recognize them as their family. They were disgrace to their people and their families. Tax collectors, they lived in an outside world. But let's think about it. It sounds like a good job. It really was. You had to earn this job. You have to prove that you have the math skills to be able to do this job. This would have been a great job. Why? Because you would have stuff and things, and you would be more prosperous than anyone else in the region. So why be a tax collector? Because you could have stuff. You could have money. You could, if you just got the education, we could let you, and you would be the most successful person. You could then go and just run around and say, I have all the money. I have all the power. I can have parties at my house. I can do anything I want. And think about it. For some of us in this room, that's who we were. We were like, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to get the big jobs. I'm going to get paid. Or maybe not. Maybe we just, we just we, we fought tooth and nail to get this really, really good job so that we could be like, now I'm important. Now I matter. And our purpose in life was so that we were driven around stuff and things and money. And we're not driven around and actually a true purpose, but we're driven around the idea of that this is what I want to be known for. Look at verse 9. And Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man called Matthew, or Levi, sitting in a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he wrote, and he followed him. Luke's gospel actually says this about the last sentence. It says, he rose and left everything. Left everything. And followed him. Think about what he left. There, there probably is no disciple. Like Peter was a poor man. Peter was a poor man. Uh, 
All, all the other ones were mostly poor. Luke was educated. He was an educated physician, but he wasn't considered rich. Uh, physicians back then weren't considered rich. They were more likely to be a slave than actually anything else. Physicians were considered slaves in that time that uh, wealthy landowners would actually want them so they could be able to take care of all the people in their household. But what this tax collector actually lost things. Like, think about it. He, Matthew was going to leave his Roman tax collecting position, which probably took him years to accomplish. And if, if he wanted his job back, he couldn't go back. There was no going back. Like, if Peter said, hey, follow me, I can always go back and be a fisherman. But being a tax collector, you're leaving everything. All the things you worked for, all the things that you have, all the things that you do, you leave it all. Matthew had land, he had money, he had power, he had status, and he leaves it all. What have you left? What have you lost for knowing Jesus? I know I have. I've told you this story before. That when I became a believer, the first thing I had to lose was I had to lose some friends. Now you're saying, well, that doesn't sound very nice. You don't want to take them to Jesus. Listen, I was a young believer. I did not know. Later in life, I got to minister and love on both of these guys. One of them actually uh, walked, in, walked an aisle, became a believer in Jesus. And I, and I won't lie, I don't know what happened to him since then. But there were two guys, Scott and Tim. When I was around Scott and Tim, my language changed. My music changed. My respect toward authority changed, even after I became a believer. Because I, had, I realized that there were friends that basically lifted me up and actually got me closer, and I felt like I was closer to the Lord. And then there was those friends who basically, it always seemed like they were shoving me as far away from the Lord as they possibly could. There are some of us in this room, we still have those relationships in our life, or we still have those situations, or maybe we even have those places that we can't go to, because we know without a doubt that we need to lose them. So I ask again, what have you lost for the Lord? Maybe it's a relationship. If you're a young person, you're dating. Maybe it's a boyfriend, girlfriend. If you're married, it's not your boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay, so let's just really say that. So, well, can I lose? No, you can't. Okay, you can't. You're married. But what's crazy about this is that Matthew was willing to leave it all. Why? Like, think about it. He had it all. He had everything he needed. He had all the stuff, all the things, everything that we would want in life. Matthew had it. Why would he leave it? Imagine being Matthew. You imagine when Matthew gets looked at by his own people and he's sitting there getting tax collectors and they're probably cussing at him and saying bad things about him and like, you know, underneath their breath, they don't trust him or believe anything that he says. And Matthew's there, and he's like, I am a traitor. My people cannot stand me. And he probably wasn't happy with the way his life was. He probably realized that I have all these things. I have everything that I need, everything that I want, and I'm the most miserable person in the town. And we know those people. We know that there are people who have everything that they would ever want, but they are the most broken and messed up of them all. And yet there's some of us who don't have anything, and here's how we feel. God, if you just will give me money, if you just will give me my retirement, if you'll just give me a new car, a new job, then I'll be happy. And Matthew's saying, listen, I have it all. And I'm still not. I got everything I need. I could do this for the rest of my life. My kids' kids, from however many wives, I can be able to be as happy as I want. But I'm still here in this tax booth, considered a traitor. I can't go into the synagogue to worship God. I can't even testify in front of court because no one trusts me and believes me. So Matthew gets up. And he follows Jesus. He follows Jesus because he probably sees Jesus. He probably hears about these stories of Jesus. Because, I mean, we, we, we can assume this. Because in a, a town of Capernaum, it wasn't a very big town. It wasn't very large. 
But the idea that some man came into this town, was healing the lame, was healing the sick, was, was you know, healing the, the people who were hurting. Uh, maybe even they heard a story of maybe the disciples came back after they got from the, from the storm, and he calms the storm. And Matthew's in his tax booth thinking, here comes that Jesus guy. He's probably just going to walk by me because I'm the worst in this room. But Jesus stops. And looks directly at Matthew. You know how many people probably have never looked at Matthew like that? When they look at Matthew, this is how they look at Matthew. You crook, you traitor, you're the worst. And there's some of you in this room, here's what you have. is You have a reputation, maybe around town, or maybe in your family, or maybe this is who you are. And you're like, this is who I am, and I don't know if I can ever change. Jesus looks at you and says this. Follow me. How good is your life anyway? Really, think about it. Without Jesus, how good is your life? What, you, you're comfortable? You have some electronics, they'll break. You have some stuff, it'll get old. You have money, you'll spend it. And it won't be worth anything tomorrow. You're healthy, you won't be sooner or later. But spiritually, Matthew, Jesus turns to Matthew and says, follow me. And he just gets up and follows him. Have you done that? Have you followed Jesus? Has he ever called you and said, hey, follow me? And you're going, yeah, but I'm known as this. I'm known as a very smart person. Maybe I even uh, have a big degree or maybe I even have all these things. But really, none of that matters. Just you and Jesus follow me. And either we listen to the call or we ignore it. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. And Jesus reclined at the table, and behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining at the table with Jesus and his disciples. For, for they, they go to Matthew's house, which probably was an amazing house right after this. They go and have a meal. To have a meal in a Jewish culture would have, would have been a meal that you would have with the dearest of friends, the dearest of friends, to be able to sit down. But he reclined at the table. In other words, he laid back. He took down his guard. And he hung out with the smartest, best, and brightest in all of the world. No, it doesn't say that. Because let's think about it. If you were a king, where would a king go? A king would only want to hang out with those who, who matter. If I was going to hang out with people in this room, I want to hang out with the people who are the richest and the best and the smartest so they can be able to tell me how great I am. We could all sit here and high-five each other and say, man, we're doing church so good. That's who we are. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus goes and he reclines at the table with tax collectors, the lowest of the low. And not just tax collector, but the tax collector's friend. The worst of the worst. That he goes and hangs out with, with not people who, anyone who was of royalty or anyone who was good or anyone who was anything. He would go and hang out with the worst. And I say this today, even as a pastor, I will never give you special treatment because of who you are. My job is to be able to call sinners just the way Jesus instructs us to. I don't care if you give the most or the least. I don't care if you're the most put together person, the most educated person, or the dumbest person in this room. Because I think I am. He's called us to, to love on each other. So to be like Jesus, we hang out with tax collectors and sinners When was the last time you had someone who you knew was broken and messed up come to your house? You're going, oh man, I won't. I won't let that riffraff in my house. Why not? Maybe God's telling us that we need to be reaching out maybe in a different way. 
The other guests were definitely not the best and the brightest. They were tax collectors and sinners. They might have even been prostitutes that were even there. Again, probably with the worst people in Capernaum, the people who we would look down on. And Jesus says, let's go have a party. And what's beautiful about this is that what, what, what Matthew's wanting to celebrate is celebrating his new faith. You ever seen a new believer? A person who's really brand new, a believer, who believes in Jesus for the first time, they immediately can't wait to celebrate. It's us church people who bring them down. Well, you need to calm down, buddy. You need to co- Listen, they need to celebrate because their lives have been spiritually awakened and they now live not for themselves but for God. That is the best thing about them. Verse 11, look at verse 11 says this, says, and when the Pharisees saw this, uh-oh, uh-oh, I told you the Pharisees were following Jesus now, uh, starting in verse 9, the Pharisees start following Jesus, the room starts to get crowded, and now we have Pharisees that are watching, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So the Pharisees must have been sitting outside of Matthew's house, and they, and they, they literally just blown away, because in their mind, if this man is the Messiah, He just forgave someone's sins, and he kind of basically called himself the Messiah in that idea. But for this man to call himself the Son of Man, for this man to call himself the Messiah, and now he's eating with tax tax collectors and sinners, he can't be the Messiah, because the Messiah would want to eat with me. I'm the Pharisee. Do you not know who I am? I'm the religious one. I'm the one that knows the Bible backwards and forwards. I'm the one who acts good, does good, looks good, smells good, whatever it is. And I say this again, there's some of us in that room, and we're that Pharisee, and we're the one who knows the Bible, and you're the one that makes people feel uncomfortable in church, because you're going, you don't know that? They don't. I'm telling you right now, when when I first went to church, I knew nothing about the Bible, nothing. I didn't know anything about the Word, I didn't know anything about Jonah and the whale, I just knew there was a fish somewhere. I got, I didn't know about, I I knew a little bit about Jesus. I knew a little bit about the cross, but I knew nothing about having a relationship with him. And yet when some of us get around people who are brand new Christians, we sit there and go, listen, you're not to my level yet. Mm, You need to probably move on. Go be discipled by someone else. No, they need you to hold their hand and show them what they don't know. To love on them, to disciple them. That's what true discipleship is. For these Pharisees were lurking outside Matthew's house, and they grabbed one of the disciples and said, why does he eat with these people? So look what Jesus says. Look at verse 12. But when he heard it, he said, and and it's funny to say when he heard it. He he already knew the hearts of the Pharisees. He already knew that they were going to say this. We see this in so many different passages in the past of what we've read so far. Verse 12. And when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. In other words, if you're sick, if you are broken, if you are, have some type of ailment, you need a doctor. People who are well don't need a doctor, but it's only those who are sick. Who's sick? It's all sinners. Technically everybody. But the Pharisees are like, we're not, we're not sick. They're sick. So Jesus says, they need a doctor. Why would I not be here? Again, I point it to you. For those who are Christians in this room, if you're not trying to help the sick, what is your job? Your job needs to be those reaching out to those who are hurting, those who are needs, those who have spiritual needs, physical needs, emotional needs, that you need to be reaching out to those people. But instead, what we do is we just kind of keep to ourselves go through life, try not to rock the boat. Jesus gives us an amazing metaphor. But he offers, think about it, Jesus offers the cure that heals sinners. And the Pharisees think they do. The Pharisees think, act like me, do like me, be like me, and then you'll be, ju- you'll be close to God. And Jesus is saying, just trust me. Just follow me. Stop chasing and trying to do, quit quit trying to earn your salvation. Listen, you can't earn it. 
You can't earn it. It is not by works. It's by nothing you do. Listen, your most righteous deeds are considered a filthy rag in front of God. Every single thing. Everything. It's nothing that you can do that can make God love you more. He already loves you by sending his son to die on a cross. That's how he showed his love. You can't earn more of that. You obey Christ not so that you can get God to love you more. You obey Christ so that you show how much you love him, how much you want to follow him, what you understand. Because when you're obedient to what God has told you to do, you're just saying, God, I appreciate and I thank you for dying on the cross. God, I will live for you. I will follow you. I will chase you to the ends of the earth because you're more that matters. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Look there at verse 13. And this is what he says to the Pharisees. Go and learn. Now, for him to say go and learn to a Pharisee, very disrespectful to the Pharisees. He actually is saying, listen, boy, you need to learn this. So he kind of like speaks to him as like a rabbi teacher. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, that's important. That comes from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. It says, he desires mercy and not sacrifice. He doesn't ask you to be good, do good, act good, you know, get your life straight and fix yourself. Listen, he says, my job is to give you mercy, to forgive the sinner. And then he will, as you follow Jesus, your heart will be transformed. You will be sanctified. You will learn the things that God loves. You will learn God's thoughts, what God wants, and you will follow Jesus and you will fall passionately in love with him. And you're sitting here saying, because here's the deal. When I was a young person, when people would say, hey, do you know Jesus? And, they would, and, and, and that would confuse the mess out of my mind. I'm going, how can I know someone? He's dead. He's gone. And they said, no, 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 son. He's rose from the grave. He is God himself. He is the Lord. He is the purpose of all things. So now I don't live in my life and my transgressions thinking to myself, okay, I better act myself, get myself straight, stop being rude, stop saying cuss words, stop listening to bad music. Don't hang out with girls that cuss, drink, or smoke, and you'll be all right. But follow him. Because he wants to sign every paper. It's paid for. It's not earned. Your story should never include, I did this. It should say, he did this. That you are falling in passionate love for what he did for you, what he did for you on the cross by stepping down from heaven, living a perfect life, dying on a sinner's cross, and then rising again three days later. And he says to Matthew, follow me. Matthew dies. Matthew dies a horrific death. But he followed Jesus to the end of his days. Why? Because he's worth it. He's worth it. Every minute of every day, he's worth it. For Jesus is using the God's word to combat these Pharisees who know God's word, and they know Hosea 6.6. 6. And then Jesus tells them his entire purpose of being here. Think about it. If, if there was one summation of why Jesus came, it's the last sentence. Look at the last sentence. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. What did he call we're sinners to? I need, you, I need you to do me a favor. Turn to Luke chapter 5, and I want you to see this in this story. Because there are some of you who always say to me, why do you always talk about this? Because you never let it go. And I never will. Jesus' entire gospel message was about this one word, this one idea. Listen to me. Salvation is not in baptism. It's the symbol that you've been baptized and you want to be old is gone and the new has come. That's what the symbol of baptism is. Okay? Infant baptism, we don't believe that. But they believe that it's actually the idea that, that your parents are saved, therefore we're going to grow you up in the house of the Lord and we're going to do this. And it gives people a false assurance of their salvation. No, no way about it. It's also not biblical, and I can't find it anywhere in the Bible. But this word is different. It's always omitted. 
It's omitted in your life. It's omitted in the way people have preached in the past. I'm telling you, listen to me. For the last 50, 60 years, people have forgotten this word. You know why? Because they're so excited to see new converts. They're so excited to have altar calls and can't wait for people to come down here and to be able to say, I did that, I did that, and pastors get this incredible arrogance about them. Because it's more about them than it is about what the word of the Lord says. This one word. And if you've been around me, honestly, we should be doing communion today because that's what the whole idea of communion is about. And I've said it already about 10 times. Look there at verse 32. Luke chapter 5, verse 32. I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. From turning from their evil ways. So think about Matthew. I call Matthew. He's living this life. He's got everything he's ever wanted. And Jesus comes and says, follow me. And he, But see, Matthew realizes that he's miserable in this life. He doesn't want this, but Jesus says, come and follow me. Yeah, but, I, but what about the money? And what about the stuff? And what about my family? And what about my wife? And what about... Come, come and follow me. Well, well, follow me. All right, I'll follow you. And he follows him. Like, do you ever feel like you don't have purpose in life? I can tell you why. You're made to glorify God in all the things that you do. Not to glorify yourself. Not to, when you die, have a whole bunch of toys and a lot of things to be able to give away to someone else. They rot and they break. It's repentance. It's what Jesus calls sinners for. He says, I call sinners to repentance. He doesn't want the righteous. He doesn't want those who are all picked up because there's really no one who is righteous. The problem with the Pharisees, they don't understand their depravity. They don't understand how sick they really are. Every one of you are sick. Every one of you are sick. And he is the cure. He is the doctor. He, not me, not becoming a member of this church. He is the cure. How bad do you need him? Maybe today, today's the first day that you're saying, man, you're right. And I've rejected it. I've said, once I understand this, once I do this, once I act this way. And you're always saying, you always have put Jesus off. And today Jesus is saying, follow me. Or maybe you're a Christian in this room and you've been living in sin and you've been living in sin apart from Christ and Christ is looking at you going, get up and follow me. There's so many in this room who have so many different stories. Listen to me. Are you following Jesus? Have you ever followed Jesus? Have you ever put your true faith and hope in him? And I can tell you this right now, the greatest part about my life is that story when I was on the third row. Because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But I knew I needed what that man was talking about. And ever since that day, it blew up my family. I mean, blew it up. My mom and dad had no clue what was about to happen. It blew up our school. It blew up all these different things. And, it, and what happened was is that Jesus completely had infiltrated all these things. And he started to open eyes. And every day, I won't lie, every day it's like I wake up and we start all over again. And he basically says, follow me. The other day, Austin talked about Matthew chapter 16. As a very simple idea of discipleship. Is that we die to ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Is that your life? If you're a Christian in this room, do you do that? Do you wake up in the morning and die to yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus? I'm going to close with this. John MacArthur said this, the theme of the gospel of Jesus is that he came to call sinners to repentance until people have been brought to see that they are sinners until they realize their thirst, their, their feel, their weight of their sin that is on their back that they can't get off, the Lord will never give them salvation. Do you understand the sin in your life? Do you understand how your sin is what separates you from God? And it's by Jesus dying on the cross that he wipes away every past, 
present, and future sin. Does that sound too good? You're right, because that's why it's the good news. The truth of the gospel according to Jesus is that the only one who is eligible for salvation are those who realize that they're sinners and need to repent. Christ's call call is an extended only to sinners who are in desperate realization of their need and desire transformation. So let me ask this. Do you want transformation? Are you tired of Levi and you want Matthew? Are you tired of the old you and want the new you? How good is it anyway? Our Lord came to save sinners. But those who are unwilling to admit their sin, he has nothing to say except for judgment. Just like me when I was sitting in that room, sitting on the third row. And I can't imagine my life if I said no. I can't imagine it. All I can imagine is the worst of worst. I mean, I can't imagine how bad it could have been, and I ignored God. Can you imagine if Matthew ignored God? And we wouldn't have this story? And there's some of you in this room, you have a testimony, and your testimony is that you are Matthew. And there's some of you right now, listen, you've ignored him so many times. I mean so many times. Are you going to do it again? Well, I'll do it when I die. No, be too late. You never know when you're going to die. Let's pray. In a moment, Austin's going to sing. We're going to, we're going to worship one more time. And I say this. If you want to follow Jesus for the first time ever, come grab me. I'll explain everything I can. Listen, I'll disciple you for as long as you'll let me. If you're a person in this room saying today, I- I'm a sinner. Or maybe I've been living in sin. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm a Christian, and, I, and what I need to do is I need to repent of sin today. Listen, you do. You need to repent of that sin. Confess it, repent, turn, and believe. Believe that he has forgiven you. Last week we talked about that completely. I'm never going to stop talking about repentance. Ever. Because that's Jesus' message. He calls p- sinners to, to repent. So if you're a sinner in this room, that's your job. To never stop repenting. To never stop turning to the Lord. So I ask you, are you following him? And this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray. And I want you to ask God, God, convict me of my sins. God, I want to I believe in you. I want to trust in you. Even though I might be a believer for years, or maybe this is the first day I've ever been a believer, God, I want to trust you. I can't imagine the day when you said, follow me, and I said no. But I can tell you this, the day I said yes is the day that everything changed. Are you tired of your life? Are you tired of the silly things and trying to put your hope in the things that don't matter? I can tell you why. This isn't about you. It's about him. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for the people in this room. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they would sit, Lord, with their eyes closed. And still so that you can speak to their hearts. That God, that you look at each and every one of us and say, follow me. And some of us who are Christians, maybe what we've not been doing is following you. 
For those who are not believers, Lord, this is the first day that we want to be believers, that we want to follow you, that we want to put our faith and trust. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would give them strength and courage to be able to come and grab someone. Let someone know. For, for what God tells us is that we have to publicly prof- pro- pro- profess our love and our devotion to you. Lord, it doesn't have to be today, but it's got to happen. Lord, never quit using us. Lord, speak to our speak to our eyes, speak to our ears, speak to our hearts, so they will be changed. Take our heart of stone and make it into a heart of flesh. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we respond in worship?
we are so thankful for your name, God, the power behind your name. God, we're thankful for the cross. And God, we're thankful for you calling people like us, people that were uh, lost and stuck in lifestyles that never satisfied, but paths that, that were headed towards eternal destruction. And God, you stepped in and you graciously and mercifully took our debt and took the punishment on the cross. And then you cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. And God, we know now that you have forgiven. And Lord, you no longer hold those things against us. And so we can rejoice. God, we can throw parties. Like Clint said, Lord, we can take joy in the fact that we are citizens in your kingdom. And God, nothing of our past has any power over us. Just as death had no power over you. And so, Lord, we rejoice in that fact this morning. And we are so thankful for you. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Guys, thank you so much. Have a seat just for a second. I just got two things to tell you. Um, So sorry that it's so late, but I'm also not. Um, Because when it comes down to some of those scriptures, I will say this. I can't wait to tell you. Like, I can't wait to tell those stories. I can't wait to explain those things. Next week, we're uh, we're actually going to skip one paragraph. We're actually going to talk about the lady who was bleeding, and we are going to talk about him raising Jairus' daughter up from the grave. It's, a, it's an unbelievable story, so be a part of that. Don't come back to hear me preach. Come back to hear what Jesus does next. That's the most important thing. One, one, just one giant announcement. Um, we, two weeks ago, we passed a building project that what we plan on doing is moving our youth group out of, from that building to this building, knocking out two, two rooms. If you have questions, if you're a member of this church, just come ask me. I'll let you know. Um, we have $100,000 that we're wanting to be able to to be able to raise. We already have 60. So we're already almost there. So when it comes down to this, we just need to be able to start our building fund. And I know that some people are asking me about, hey, how do I give to that? There's ways to give. The ways to give is on your card. If you want to write a check, you can be able to, inside the little envelope, you write building fund on that. And it goes directly to the building fund. It gets designated just to that. If you want to give online, if you go online, there's two drop-down boxes. It's either you're giving to your regular general ties, or you can give to the building fund. Either way, those are the two easiest ways. If you want to just give a check to me and I just give it to Stephanie, we can be able to do that, but there needs to be witnesses, but I'll, I'll figure that out. But I promise you, if you want to be able to help this out, this is an amazing opportunity for us to be able to give above and beyond. Think about it. What God has given you that we can be able to bless others because it's not just going to our youth group. Our children's ministry will go up to the second floor. They will get all new stuff to the second floor. The youth ministry, we get a whole new room. And the adults ministry, who was struggling going upstairs, we're going to get to bring them downstairs so they will be able to go and have classes, and we'll be able to have more classes. So guys, it's a great time to be a part of Holly Springs. It's an exciting time to see how God's growing us, not just with, just with buildings and stuff, but with people. If you haven't got to know someone new, there's new people all around here. You need to know them. And God's doing amazing miracles even today. Let me pray for you before we leave. Lord, thank you so much for the people in this room. God, I thank you for their hearts and their willingness to to endure such a long sermon. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that they heard your name. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that they can be able to leave here and walk out of this room, not be worried about what the world has, but Lord, that they understand that you're in control of all things. That God, you are all that we need. Lord, let us follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. Guys, have a great week.